1947, it was called the Garment Workers Scheme. It brought some 2,500 refugees to Canada between 1948 and 49, tailors and their families who had survived the Holocaust. They came with nothing but skill and built lives and families and futures. Now called the Taylor Project, which includes an upcoming book and documentary, their stories contain lessons for all of us, including about settling refugees in Canada today. Here with more, the founder of the Taylor Project, that's Larry Enkin, son of Max Enkin, one of the leaders of the original effort. Kim Coulter, president and CEO of the nonprofit employment agency, JVS Toronto. And Paul Klein is here. He's founder and CEO of the consulting firm, Impact. And we're delighted to welcome everybody here to TVO tonight for a very important conversation. Mr. Rankin, I'm going to start with you. First of all, you're only 90 years young, right? <laughs> Correct. You are only 90 years young. Lovely to have you here. The Garment Workers Scheme, what was that? This was originally uh, through the Department of the Ministry of Labor. And it was based on the concept that uh, uh, Canada was short of skilled labor in various fields. At the end of World War II. At the end of World War II, it started in the logging industry. And the Jewish community picked up that idea and thought one way to bring Jews to Canada would be by having a tailor project. So these were the garment scheme. These were Jewish refugees who had survived Hopefully the Holocaust. Hopefully, this would be Jewish refugees uh, still in the DP camps, the displaced persons camps in Europe. And your dad and, was one of them. Uh, he was one of the five that went over. It was a team of five, uh, uh, made up of both uh, uh, manufacturers and the labor, and it was a very solid team, very very much. Uh, involved in the project because they had arranged to commit many manufacturers to take on these new tailors and give them jobs. 2,500? Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg, yes. 2,500 tailors? 2,500 tailors. So if you do the math and consider their families and their progeny, we're talking about many, many, many thousands of people. That's right. Hmm. How did you learn about this story? Larry's apartment actually. Um, he told me this story. I've known Larry for a very long time. And in the fall of 2017, um, Larry had, um, had reconnected, I think, with this story through um, a, a re remarkable uh, woman a writer named Dan Dublin, um, whose father had been part of the Taylor Project originally. And Larry told me about this project. Of course, I'd never heard about it, neither had many other people. And he said, I wonder if we could find out who the tailors are, where they are today. And the first thing that um, Larry's initial idea still is core to what our approach is, is understanding not just their experience in Europe and the Holocaust, but in a longitudinal sense, what happened after they came to Canada, what happened to their families. And one of the, also one of the first things he said is if we could find them, perhaps we could write a book about it their experience and it's turned into much more than that yes it has it's turned into a whole thing it has you, you a light went on over your head i guess and in you dove oh and we dove well we didn't actually know i would say at the very beginning it was possible that we might not have found who these people are their names it was 70 years ago um but the real um the real key to it happened larry and i last in in january of 2018 i believe larry and i went to montreal we went to visit the Canadian Jewish Archives and the Montreal Holocaust Museum. And in the basement of the Canadian Jewish Archives, they started to pull out these boxes with original file folders for every ship wow. that came to Canada um, in that time. And in those folders were all the manifests from the ships, lists of the people who came, the tailors, their religion, where they were from in Europe, where they were going into, into where they were going in Canada. So this mm. Taylor project is mm. now mm. is now a thing. Mm. And of the original 2,500 tailors that were brought over after World War II, uh, some of them are still alive, I presume. Yes. Well, we we are in direct. We have been in touch with I think about six of the tailors who are still alive, and then we have also heard from about 110, I believe, other families of tailors and uh, are documenting their stories now. 
And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's your mission now, is to document these stories. It is, and we're moving as quickly as we can. And, um, and this, the book that we are um, writing based on their experiences and stories we published in 2020. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. JVS, how did you guys get involved in this? Well, we got involved because Max Ankin was actually- His dad. His dad <laughs> was our founding, founding chairperson. Oh, and so he actually okay. established JVS in 1947. Which stands for, I think, Jewish Vocational, Jewish Vocational Services. Jewish Vocational Services of Metropolitan Toronto okay. is, our, is our official name. And we were started to serve Holocaust survivors and refugees after World War II who were coming to Canada, help find jobs. So would you have been, I mean, maybe it's unknowable, but would you have been involved in trying to find work for the original tailors who came over at the end of the war? It appears that some of them, you know, it's been hard yeah. for us to get all that data. Uh, yeah. we, were, we were looking, but there's certainly a link between, between JVS and the Taylor Project coming, coming over, no doubt. Hmm. Um, and what, what's interesting is to see kind of how that developed over time, because at first it was about, let's get people jobs. Let's focus on jobs. The other thing that started to happen within about two years is the emotional trauma piece of many of the folks who were coming to Canada um, and to Toronto in particular. And we, we started to expand our services that soon for the Jewish community around rehabilitation services. So for people who were having emotional trauma and were having a hard time keeping a job, moving into the labor market and needing support to, to do that as well, related to the trauma. That's a good follow-up to you, Mr. Rankin. Uh, if you would, put us, put us into the time. Put us at the end of World War II. You've got these people who've <clears throat> been through absolute misery and hell and are coming to Canada to essentially rebuild their lives. They're living in displaced persons camps because they have no longer any home in European countries. And there's no country that's willing to take them. And Canada became the first opportunity for anyone to get out of these DP camps. Even Palestine wasn't yet begun as a, uh, as a welcoming country. Consequently, the idea of, of a plan to get you into Canada, everybody wanted to get in, whether, whether they had the skills or not. In fact, one famous <laughs> individual made the point to my father <clears throat> with, with the comment that, don't they want intellectuals? Don't they want educated people in Canada? And he, he actually convinced my father to let him pass through. <clears throat> the issue for the Canadian government was basically whether or not you were Jewish. Strangely enough, they suddenly latched onto that and my father got an email in London, Ontario, London, Canada, London, England, before he went over, saying no more than 50% could be Jews. Mm -hmm. mm. And this mm. almost uh, stopped the entire project. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, that was a far cry from a decade earlier when none was too many. That's right. Where so no not, Jews it were allowed at all. The, it was still the times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was 18, 19 years old and everything was, was of that nature in Canada. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I was fully immersed in all the issues of what kind of career I would have, what schools I could go to, what education I could have, mm -hmm. where I could holiday. All this was true in Canada at that time. Now, Paul, t tell us, all right, so we have these, these people who have been through just incredible hell. They've now arrived in Canada. They know nobody, presumably. Mm -hmm. How do they begin to reestablish lives? Who hires them? Who's responsible for them? Tell us all of that. Well, part of what the innovation was with the Taylor Project was that they came, they were brought to Canada from the displaced person, from the terrible conditions in the displaced persons camps and, as tailors. Some were tailors, some were not tailors. And um, the program part of it was such that they were brought to Canada, they were assigned jobs at tailoring businesses and factories, and largely in Toronto, Winnipeg, and Montreal. They were given $25 to help them get settled. Um, they had to work at this factory for a minimum of a year, during which time they had to pay back the $25. And after that, um, some of them continued on. Some of them, the people who actually were tailors, continued on, some of them in the jobs that they had. The people who were not tailors um, then went on to other things, and that's where the important role mm -hmm. of JVS comes into play, because these people 
wanted to do Other work that they knew how to do. So let's pick up the story here. Mm -hmm. What kinds of jobs would JVS had put them into at the time? Well, it's, you know, that that's probably widespread depending on what skills some mm. of the folks had. And we still have that issue today. So today, JVS serves unskilled uh, people right through to internationally trained professionals. So again, some of the folks coming through, primarily the focus would probably be on a survival job. And back then, there were not a lot of government programs available mm. to support retraining, recertification, any, any of those areas. For the most part, they were probably entry-level jobs, um, some unskilled, some skilled uh, things like finance, uh, mm. um, accounting, uh, those kinds of jobs, because language skills, if, if, if English you know, was, a, was an issue in terms of, of work, those kind of, skill, those kind of jobs would be easier for people to move into as well. Well, that's a good point. Mr. Inkin, what percentage of the people coming over would have had any facility in English or French at all? What they mainly spoke was Yiddish. Yeah. Yiddish. And, and one of the uh, characteristics were, were that they began to form their own social groupings. And it was a wonderful reinforcement mm -hmm. and strength building that many of them came from the same little village in, in Europe. And they actually became a very solid community within themselves. Mm -hmm. In fact, I once asked, did they, were they aware of any anti-Semitism in Canada? And often they said no, mm -hmm. because they were living in a kind of a bubble. Mm. And they went to work, and they came home, and they were amongst their own kindred spirits. Paul, to the best of your knowledge, were any people rejected for this Taylor Project program back then? Now, that's a good question. I'm sure they were, but I don't, I don't, we don't have any statistics on that. You mean, uh, you mean at the government level? Yeah, was it, were there any people who tried to come over under this mm. uh, absolutely. garment no, worker absolutely. scheme? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Unfortunately, mm. they were. They did have to try a test. Mm. And originally it was, it was the sewing machine, literally, and, but, but travel conditions for the team were difficult. Mm. And so they ended up saying, okay, could you sew a uh, buttonhole? And the grapevine from DP camp to DP camp quickly mm. told what the test was. Mm -hmm. mm. So that theoretically, people who knew nothing learned how to do enough to pass the test. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me try, this is a bit of an odd political question mm. here, but, but clearly the Mackenzie King government before and during the war had an attitude about Jewish immigration, which was basically nothing. Mm -hmm. And now here we're in a post-war period, mm -hmm. the late, 19, late 1940s. Mm -hmm. It's the same party in power. It's the same liberals. It's the same Mackenzie King government. And suddenly there is this program designed specifically to bring Jewish no, no. refugees here. No. no? It came <laughs> under the Ministry of Labor, not under the Ministry of Immigration. And that's how it passed. But it's the same it government. It came under skilled labor. Skill shortage. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Still it, shortage, it, it, right? That's and that's why my father got the mm -hmm. alert from C.D. Howe mm -hmm. saying no more than 50% Jews when the cabinet suddenly realized what was happening. I uh, see. Yeah, okay. there wasn't, it was, yeah, it was positioned as a, as, you know, filling a labor shortage yeah. here in this yeah. industry. Not as a benevolent thing for... Right. The degree right. Right. which there actually was a labor shortage, hmm. questionable. Okay, okay. That, that makes more sense. Because C.D. Howe was the minister of everything in that McKenzie yes, King government. Right. Uh -huh. So you're saying as soon as they got wind of the fact that, that there were Jews involved in this, that's when he said 50% and no that's more. Right. That's mm -hmm. right. Okay. <laughs> Starting to figure this out. Yeah. All right. Quite a story. When did, when did you start collecting the stories of those who had come across? It started about 10 years after when I, was, uh, I got a call that the tailor wanted to come and visit. And he was sitting in my office... Uh, and he saw my father walk by and he said, I know that man. Mm. He selected me from the DP camps. So my father came in and in the course of conversation, uh, my father said an unusual question. He said, tell me of all the people that came over under the garment or tailor scheme, you're the only tailor I know that's left in the industry. And there was a pause and the man said, but Mr. Enkin, I was a tailor. <laughs> which led me to wonder mm. who were the people that mm -hmm. came over, what mm. happened to them. Mm -hmm. And that stayed in my mind for years. And then finally I got the idea that I'd like to find out about them. Mm -hmm. And what did you do next? And the next thing was to really, uh, speaking with Paul, but I was interested, it was an unusual opportunity, because here we are 70 years, 
And I now had a chance to not only see the first generation, but the second generation and the third generation, mm -hmm. to see what they had done, what they have accomplished, and what they have contributed to Canada. Oh, and it's okay. an amazing story of what immigration can mean over the long term. Not yeah. just look at the first generation mm -hmm. and be concerned about that, but what happens over a longer period of time and the great contribution that these individuals mm -hmm. have made yeah. is absolutely astounding. Well, yeah. since you've taken us there, let's go there. Mm -hmm. Kim, mm -hmm. Kim, we're having a great debate in the country right now, and I'm sure mm -hmm. it will be enhanced as we get closer to a federal election in the fall mm -hmm. about what the appropriate immigration levels are and about whether mm -hmm. immigrants contribute to or detract from the country uh, as a whole. You got any views on that? I've got plenty of views <laughs> on that for sure. We're all ears. So, uh, JVS, you know, our roots are in the Jewish community. Our services have grown. One of our biggest divisions is services to, for newcomers to Canada. So you don't just serve Jewish? No. Jewish no, community? You're... No. That's how we started. Okay. We started serving the Jewish community around jobs, then around rehabilitation services, and then, back then, what was uh, called the Community Chess, which is now today United Way, approached us about serving the broader community. So the Syrian refugees that came over a few years ago, would you have been involved in that? Yes, for sure you we were. were. Okay. Not around the settlement piece. You know, there's, there's organizations uh, that focus on settlement. Our focus was on employment. We partner with those settlement organizations. So, for example, when the Syrian refugees came, we had one specific project for women um, who, who had come over from Syria, who had never worked, had only worked in the home in Syria. And when they came to Canada, their husbands were getting jobs, their kids were get, you know, getting settled in schools and those kinds of things. And we ran a program to say, well, what, what skills are we looking at now? And how can we support those, those women to move forward? So certainly workplace lang English language skills, workplace language skills. But we found in those groups, um, many of the women were focused on cooking and sewing, still mm. <laughs> sewing. Mm. And so we were support, supporting those women to look for jobs in those areas to start their own businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And how's it worked out? It's worked out fairly well, mm. um, for, for sure. Um, but in addition to, to, um, to that kind of support, one of the, the most interesting uh, pieces of work that we've done over the last few years is online services for people before they come to Canada, mm -hmm. helping them get ready to mm -hmm. come to Canada. So I was at a, one of our newcomer awards uh, ceremonies about two months ago, and they had um, guest speakers from different countries who had connected with JVS online through our pre-arrival services, which is a broader partnership with other organizations across Canada, um, to receive job search support, learn about the Canadian labor market, uh, learn about the Toronto labor market, and connect them with mentors in their field mm -hmm. of interest. Mm -hmm. And three of those folks came and within six weeks had jobs in Canada mm -hmm. when they arrived because of those kind of early connections. So mm -hmm. those new services, no one's working through the Rolodex anymore and making the call to somebody who owns a business, a manufacturing, saying, can we find a job for a tailor? Mm -hmm. it's changed. Well, okay, let's try this. And again, I want to I uh, take the experience of 70 years ago and I want to apply it to today. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make the argument that this group of people, these tailors who came over in the late 1940s, uh, seem to have adapted very well to their new lives in Canada. They got jobs, they fit in, their progeny have done well here, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't have to tell you, there are many people, maybe some watching us right now, who feel that the immig immigrants and the refugees who come to Canada today are less well suited to fitting into this country, mm -hmm. its mores, its customs, mm -hmm. its values, et cetera. Mm -hmm. What do we do about that? Well, first of all, it's obviously just not true. I mean, and so. The, the one of the magical things that happened as a result of doing this work and, and researching the stories of the original tailors and the social innovation that happened in 1948 and really which characterized, I would say, JVS's work then and today. Mm -hmm. I love that story, you know, of the program you have now where it's mm -hmm. you know, we're using technology and so on. Still innovative. So what we started <clears throat> to ask ourselves, so wonder if we wa started wondering if the experience of the Taylors in 1948 and the response of and role of business in helping Taylors succeed was still relevant today with refugees today. And? Well, what we found okay. out <clears throat> was, I mean, it was really, we had no, no expectation at all, but uh, what we found out <clears throat> was that about a third of the Syrian and other refugees who come here today, to Kim's point, had skills as mm -hmm. 
tailors. And then we thought, well, I wonder if this could be applied in the same way. What if we were able to bring, as my colleague Sam says, um, the experience and learning and social innovation of 1948 to full circle to address the needs mm -hmm. of refugees today? Because, as you say, they came here in very similar circumstances, with, you know, came here, you know, left their homes against their will. Mm -hmm. War-torn countries. War-torn mm -hmm. countries, apart. PTSD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no language skills, unstable housing. Um, and, um, and in today, precarious employment. That's mm -hmm. the main difference, right? I mean, in the, the case of the Taylors, they had employment at mm -hmm. least for a year. Mm -hmm. People are coming here without employment mm -hmm. and not able to, to use the vocational skills that they right. actually have. Right. So we thought, well, what would it take to actually make that happen? And, and I would say the thing that, and, and to use the Taylor Project as a sort of a beacon to create awareness about the value of refugees and help immigrants and others, newcomers to Canada, succeed here in Canada. Okay, in which case, Mr. Rankin, let's finish up on this. Do, <clears throat> do you believe that the experiences of the late 1940s with the Taylors who came over here are comparable to the experiences that refugees trying to adapt to a new world, a new life in Canada today, are experiencing as well? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I really, really don't know whether we can compare one generation to another. And therefore, I, I would be reluctant to give you a positive answer one way or another. <clears throat> what I do know is that immigrants, when they arrive in a country, see the opportunities that Canada has to offer. And to realize that this is a multicultural community which welcomes people from all parts of the world. I worked in an in a industry and in a company in which we employed only immigrants. Mm -hmm. No which, Canadians wanted to go into Which it. company and what kind of work was this? In men's clothing manufacturing. Mm -hmm. okay. And we, we saw the waves of immigration all through. The boat people, the, the Vietnamese was a good example. Mm -hmm. That they came and they were wonderful workers. Mm -hmm. And we just found over the generations, each generation found their own milieu mm -hmm. and their own opportunities. Work ethic. Can I just ask you finally, wh when did your father die? 1990. 1990. Okay, so a long time ago now. Yes. <clears throat> um, can you imagine what he would think about your efforts? I have no <laughs> idea. Anytime anybody's asked me what my father would think, I never know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know he loved you, right? <laughs> you know he loved you. You got to assume he'd be pretty. Then I'll assume. <laughs> okay, you got to assume he'd be pretty impressed with what you've been up to for the last decade. Well, we're very grateful, and in fact, it, it was so special that my uh, brother, who is four years older than me, made a special trip in Victoria just to be at the occasion. Hmm. You did, yeah, I guess the occasion you're referring to is the, the big the, ceremony the special that evening. took yeah. place a couple of weeks ago at Holy Blossom Temple in yes. uh, Midtown Toronto. Yeah. Prime Minister came in for it, lots mm -hmm. of dignitaries. Yeah. That was a pretty good night. Hmm. It was. Okay, well, we all know better now what the Taylor Project is all about, and I want to thank Larry Ankin, who is the founder, son of Max Ankin from many, many years ago, and Kim Coulter, the president and CEO of JVS Toronto for coming in today, and Paul Klein, who's the founder and CEO of Impact, which basically you guys are all into uh, social good and that kind of stuff, right? We absolutely are. Trying yeah. to have impact with a K as opposed to with a C. Mm -hmm. That's how you spell it. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks all of you for coming into TVO tonight. We're grateful for your time. Thank you, Thank Steve. You. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.